Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Mustard Seed Generations Fireside Chat. Tonight, we'll be covering a very exciting topic, one as a mother of, of, of a one-year-old I'm personally very, very excited for. Um, our topic tonight is Korean American parenting, and I'm personally very excited that we'll be having some time with Dr. Josephine Kim. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to our one and only Dr. Josephine Kim. Uh, she is has a lot of accolades, but I'll just mention a few. She is a senior lecturer of education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. She is a licensed mental health counselor and nationally certified counselor. She is also the founder of Mustard Seed Generation, and she's the author of several books uh, ranging around topics around children's self-esteem, the impact of fathers, and more. And so please join me in a virtual round of applause in welcoming <laughs> Dr. Joe Kim. Hi, Dr. Hello. Joe. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, I feel like I'm still recovering from that video and still processing it. <laughs> but I guess to just begin, I mean, you have lived experience as a parent yourself, and you are obviously a professional traveling across the world um, to share about parenting and what that might look like in various contexts. But how have your own experiences raising a child um, influenced your views on parenting personally within the Korean American community? Woo! <laughs> you know, and Kathy, you mentioned that video having this impact on you. And it's interesting when you become a parent because you can resonate with both the children right in the video as well as the parents now um and so yeah it becomes so much more complicated and and i want to look at it as we're becoming more mature right in the best ways possible and i think sometimes it can only happen through parenting so mm -hmm. going back to your question um my view is that it's not easy <laughs> You know, I'm so tempted to call all of my publishers and say, burn all my books. I really didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> you know, um, wow, my child keeps me very, very humble. And so if uh, if you're finding it difficult, please know you're not alone. Um, we're all there, right there with you. So my view is that it's not easy, um, especially as kids hit that preteen adolescent stage and and wow, as Korean American parents, we really have our work cut out for us because um, our kids not only are going through the normative developmental types of things that any child and adolescent would go through, um, but they have to now navigate culturally, racially, their ethnic identities and, and navigate multiple cultures. And I think that's really, really challenging. Um, and so raising bicultural, bilingual kids, it's a lot harder than, you know, one would think. Um, and also given the realities of just living in this environment, right, and in this generation, I think they have a lot of challenges that I know I certainly can't even imagine right? Because they're just so different. But having said all of that, I also want to say we can't help but be very excited, mm -hmm. right? Because our children, I mean, think about it, bicultural, bilingual, cross-cultural kids, that's exactly what the world needs. That's what any corporation you can imagine wants. That's what any higher education institution wants. This ability to be able to negotiate between multiple contexts, being able to read social cues and adjusting your behaviors and your words to fit into that you know, uh, cultural environment. This is exactly what the world needs, right? When people are struggling to compromise and empathize, with each other, as we see all over the news all the time, our kids are actually learning to empathize with multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. They're actually learning every day to negotiate cultures, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's between the parent and them, or if you're lucky and blessed and you've got grandparents in the home, right? Some of you might say that's a headache. I want to say that's a blessing because believe it or not, your children are learning skills that they would really never learn otherwise. And so, yes, it's hard and what a blessing. Um, and if we, if we can work hard, right, and do the few things that I think will help 
our Korean American kids, I really do think we have a phenomenal opportunity to raise these global citizens who will ultimately, um, yeah, I mean, the world is their stage, right? And we can really raise tremendous leaders who can be so influential one day. I love that. I love that we started with parenting is hard, but knowing all of these assets that are bicultural and bilingual children um, can have, like it really is a gift to the world. And so I appreciate you saying that. I know there's a little girl at my church who apparently started to like bow to Insa to um, Asian Americans and like wave to non-Asians already, like already knowing as a toddler. And I found that so fascinating to your point about, you know, the, the mm -hmm. being able to navigate different settings and cultures. I love that. Wow. Um, this next question, I'm, I'm especially curious as a new parent myself, but, you know, right now there's like different ways to eat, like feed your child, like try this <laughs> method, so many like things out there. And I think to your point, it's always changing. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, based on your journey, what advice would you give to like the newbie, the younger Korean American parents who are just starting out? Because we're desperate. I think what I <laughs> I'm desperate. <laughs> I think one of the first things I would say is just be gracious. Be gracious to yourself. Um, and by the way, parents who are gracious to themselves actually are more gracious to their children. Um, and so anytime, you know, we're dealing with kids, it's always about the parents first, right? If your child is cranky and angry, you have to wonder what kind of mirroring am I doing in their lives, right? I remember a period in, in you know, my child's life where he was cranky all the time, really sassy. And, you know, it's, it's at those moments, my Koreanness gets like really heightened, <laughs> right? Um, and you begin to, to like take it personally. And then I really had to sit and look inward and say, gosh, what what is the image I've been showing him lately? Because parents really are the mirrors, right? Everything we do, everything we say, um, everything we eat, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a mirror um, and they learn to really build their own identities by looking at the reflection in the mirror, right? But that means we have to be gracious. And what I mean by that really is please don't be perfect. We don't need to be raising another generation of Korean American perfectionists. Would we all agree? Is it just me? <laughs> Isn't it enough that our generation suffered with perfectionism? Do we really need to pass that on? Right? And so let's be gracious, be gracious to ourselves, be gracious to our children. Also, I don't know if this is helpful, but I often start the day reminding and kind of urging myself to think about my child as somebody else's child. Think about how you treat other children, right? Think about like how you treat your friend's children. Super nice. Do you want anything else to eat? What else? Oh my gosh, so cute. And then when it comes to our own children, <laughs> right? And so sometimes I say, you know what? Let me treat my child as I would treat, right? One of my best friend's children. Um, and that actually helps me, believe it or not. Um, and so it's like a little cue that I do for myself. Um, but yeah, please be gracious. Don't be perfect. We really need to show them our weaknesses and just be very transparent and authentic. You know, I think our generation really grew up thinking our parents were just superhuman, right? We saw them as they can put up with anything, they can conquer anything, they can make superhuman sacrifices. Um, and we really never or very rarely got to see their humanness. Um, and oftentimes it's because their humanness was, was kind of deemed as being shameful on their account. You know, they would think that it's really shameful to be weak or to cry or to talk about how they're struggling. Um, and I think there's a real missed opportunity because it's only through those very transparent, authentic, genuine moments of our humanness can our children really connect with us, right? Um, and so, yeah, let's not be perfect. Let's make lots of mistakes. The only thing is when we do make mistakes, it's all about how you recover from that right? How you reconcile from that, how you kind of heal from that, right? 
And so there are lots of times I make lots of mistakes with my child, but I also know when to say, gosh, I'm really sorry. Can we do a restart? <laughs> that is not how I wanted to say that. Can I get another chance? Right. And so I think that's kind of what our, our children need, especially as Korean Americans. We have to fight the urge to be perfect. I love that. I had to mute myself because I noticed I kept doing that. Oh, mm. <laughs> it's like it's going to be very distracting. But I love your point <laughs> about you can only be gracious to your children when you're gracious to yourself. I definitely that really resonated just as a first time mom. And I love your idea of being a mirror and you have to be authentic and let's not be perfect. When do we get to hear that? Um, and, you know, just being mindful of you know, apologizing when we do we make those mistakes. So thank you for yeah. that. I think those are really important points. Um, I know we had a lot of families. Um, yes, we don't have to be perfect, but still we are expected to, you know, teach our culture, like teach the language. I don't want my child to look Korean, but like not have the language ability. So we have some questions around, you know, our families who live in the US, is it important for our children to know Korean culture and the language? Yeah, you know, I think when they're younger, it may not feel as important, right? But what's interesting, and, and this is where a little bit of the scholarly work comes in, because I think through literature and through research, we can really, um, you know, grasp some wisdom that really helps us. So what we know about immigrant children, especially Asian American children, is that because they're not given the opportunity to practice their ethnic identities, Right. So let's say they go to school. Usually they don't hear a thing about Asian American history. Right. Even though that's also U.S. history. Um, nobody's really asking them about, well, in your culture, how, you know, how do people do this or that? There's there's really a lack of curiosity sometimes. It's much more a patronizing type of curiosity if there is, you know, curiosity at all. And so. What we find is that when kids are not given the opportunity to practice developing their cultural identities, then it actually delays the onset of puberty. Think about that. Oof, I know. It delays, I'm not talking about a physical puberty. I'm talking about like it delays your adolescence. What I mean by that is in your adolescence, you're supposed to explore. You're supposed to figure out who you are. You're supposed to figure out what do I like? What do I not like? What am I good at? What am I not good at? Right? What do I enjoy doing? Um, what are things that really drive me nuts? Like these are all things that will cultivate your identity. Um, and that's also a time where we figure out who we are. So we're supposed to figure out who we are culturally and racially and ethnically and how we fit in. But if we're not ever given the chance to practice, then guess what happens? Delayed onset of adolescence means that things that you're supposed to do, let's say in your middle school and high school years, we end up doing post-college. Oh, and you might nod to that because when you see our children, for example, who don't really, you know, they're, they're like, why do I need to speak Korean? I hate Korean school, <laughs> right? I have to raise my hand, that was me. I'm <laughs> you know, it's such a battle getting our kids to go to a Korean school. Why do I, well, I'm in the US, you know, well, I'm American, right? And I can, you know, attest that that was exactly me. But the reality is, just because you feel white and you feel American, I'm sorry, but nobody else sees you that way, right? <laughs> and so you won't really be treated as such. But if there's a delayed onset of adolescence, that means when, when you enter college, you're now supposed to, as an adult, as a, you know, a, a, an early adulthood, you're supposed to explore kind of these lifelong types of things like your career, like your life partner, right? And how you're thinking about your future trajectory. Instead, guess what we're doing? Oh my gosh, I all of a sudden love Korean food. I'm rapping now to my favorite Korean song that I just learned. I have no idea what it says, but I can now rap to it, right? And now I'm surrounded by people who look just like me because isn't it interesting how that happens, right? Especially in the late adolescence kind of pre-adulthood stage. And what you're going to find is, again, we're supposed to have moved on from that and you're supposed to now focus on 
again, these long-term career relationships, settling down, this type of thing. But we're so busy trying to do what we were supposed to do in our adolescence. So it delays a lot of that process. So, you know, sometimes I have Korean parents who say, my child is 30 and they still haven't figured out what they're doing. Well, can we really blame them? Because much of their adulthood was spent on trying to figure out their cultural identities and racial ethnic identities and how they fit into this world, right? Wow, I think when you said it delays adolescence, I'm sure everyone's like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? But it makes total sense. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. And I'm sure that has an impact on, I mean, our, one of our favorite topics, mental health. Um, when you're doing that cultural identity discovery much later when to your point when everyone else is kind of moving on to other things. And so, you know, we know that mental health can be a pretty sensitive topic in, in, in various mm -hmm. cultures and especially in the Korean American community. And so I know a lot of folks always have questions on, you know, as a parent, like what are some effective ways for us to start conversations about mental health with their children? Yes, and I'm so appreciative that this question is in here because the children aspect, they will always ask me, how do I start this conversation with my parents, right? And so it's definitely on young people's minds. Um, and you'll find that our, our new generation of young people, they're really open to mental health. But think about why that might be the case. They hear it all the time. Now it's all over the media. They go to school and people talk about mental health because we actually look at the school as a key prime place to talk about mental health. In fact, kids are saying we actually want safe people we can talk to, you know, talk to about mental health. And often they'll say that's their educator, right, in the school. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look at how open they are to mental health and talking about it, they're so open. It's the parents who are kind of stuck. And a big part of the issue is parents feel like their kids don't want to talk about it, right? So it's not even like, how do I approach this? It's more like, do I want to approach it? I also want to, let's just be very honest, right? Many parents are scared to talk about it because they don't want to know what's on the other side. It's almost like we can't handle it. You know, I wouldn't be able to handle it if my child told me they're miserable, they have no friends, and they want to end their lives, right? But parents, let me ask you, wouldn't you rather know, though? Wouldn't you rather want to know if your child is literally at the edge, right? Um, wouldn't you want to know? Because who's going to help other than you? Right. And so as hard as it is, I do think it's so important to talk about it. And because they're so open to talking about it. Right. It's almost like, you know, I have a, a brother who's 10 years younger than me. Right. And so when he was like growing up, my parents, I mean, talk about being removed generationally. <laughs> you know, they would take him to like the Mogyoktang and they would, you know, people would ask, oh, is that your grandchild? Right. <laughs> yeah, because there's 13 years between him and my older brother. So you can imagine. And so my mom came to me one time. Right. And I was in high school. My younger brother was still very little. And she's like, what do kids his age like talk about these days? And I said, oh, mom, the next time you talk to him, you should ask him what Shaquille O'Neal is doing these days, right? Because <laughs> he was really into basketball. And I can tell you, my little brother, he almost fainted when my mother went to him and say, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but why am I sharing this story with you? It takes that type of effort to bridge the generations. That means we need a study. What do we need a study? I mean, when you were pregnant, right? Kathy, how many books did you read on the fetus and the development of the fetus? And you reminded yourself every week, oh, what's happening in week 24? Oh my gosh, what's happening in week 30? Tell me, how consumed were you with that? I had apps. I would have apps that would show me drawings and comparisons of what size they are. Like, it's the size of an orange. And I would, like, tell Raven. I would tell my family not that, you know. And to your point, yes, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. And you celebrated when the eyes were, you know, like, it came to be when fingernails were, you know, like, yeah. how come we don't do that with our children now? Mm -hmm. We need a study. 
What are they up against? What are the challenges children are facing today? What about their development? What, what is changing about their bodies, mm-hmm. right? You really can't blame a teenager for having, you know, re- strong reactions. You know why? Because that is how their brains are right now. You cannot blame them. It's their bodies. You know, the other day I was talking to my son about something and he just like, oh, had this strong reaction. And I was like, wait, where did that come from? And then he said, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, mom. That's not what I wanted to say or how I wanted that to come out. But I just couldn't control it. It just came out like that. And he said, I'm sorry. Now, I was really proud of that moment. But it really speaks to where they are developmentally. Their brains are the most sensitive, especially during their adolescence. That means any stressor they experience, they feel it in such a heightened, maximized way. You and I cannot even imagine it, right? And anything, any little stressor that you and I would think is like no big deal, to them it feels monumental because again, this is how their bodies are changing and their brain development, that's the stage they're in, right? But if you don't know this about your teenage child, it's so easy to take it personally it's so easy to do one, you know, one of two things, either take it personally and get very wounded or two, think your child is so bad, right? That you begin to now react and speak to them as a bad child, right? And neither is good for, you know, either of you, right? And so I think we have to study the best way, in my opinion, to talk about mental health and the broach these issues, very sensitive issues, even if they're very open to talking about it, they may not be open to talking to you about it, right? And so first of all, parents, if they don't want to talk to you, please don't force them, right? This is a perfect time to like have these little scripts, right? That you can fall back on and a perfect script or a great script, we're gonna throw away the word perfect, but a, a good one might be something like, you know, you don't have to talk to me because I know it may not always feel very, you know, the most comfortable, but I hope you can find a trusting adult that you can talk to. In fact, who, who might that person be? You know, do you actually want me to reach out to this person and say you want to talk to them, right? So it's doing that bridge work. It's making sure they're talking to somebody that both you and they can trust Right? We certainly don't want them speaking to somebody we don't know because right, we want to make sure we have, we have shared values and those types of things. But it's doing that bridge work. I also think if they are willing to talk to you, and even if they're not, one of the best ways to approach it is talk about yourself. Talk about your inner mental health struggles. You know, There are days when it's really, really challenging. And it's amazing to be able to say, you know what, I just want you to know I had a really, really challenging day at work, right? So I need a lot of grace right now, you know, and just name that. And it's it's a great opportunity for your child to also say, oh my gosh, my mom's human, right? She too struggles. And yeah, I have those days too. And so if if I need grace in those days, I can certainly extend her some grace too. And then share, don't just kind of say I had a hard day. But talk about why it was hard, because more than likely they can resonate, right? And then at the end of it, the beautiful part is leave with an, like an open invitation, right? And the open invitation is, has that ever happened to you, right? Have you ever felt that way, right? So it's like, here I am being vulnerable. I'm self-disclosing, you know, these parts that right now are not making me feel good. But really you're being very intentional because ultimately it's an open invitation. Like here's how you could do it just like I did it. And here's also an invitation for you to do the same if you want. Another key thing for us to remember, conversations, especially with our kids, it's never a one-time thing. Don't feel like you have to start and finish and like wrap it up in a nice bow, um, you know, that one time. It's, it's a forever thing, right? And so even if it doesn't go quite your way, that's okay. So we don't have to do it now, right? Now, will you let me know though, the next time you might feel this way and you just wanna talk? Again, you're leaving that door open, the ball is in their court, they feel like they have some control, right? 
Another thing is don't try to have these conversations when things are not going well between the two of you, right? You just thought about something. So by the way, how's your mental health? Are you kidding me? <laughs> right? Yeah. Do it when you're having a good time. Maybe you just watched a movie together and you're both in a good mood. Like these are the moments to do it. And also take advantage of those long rides you have to give them to their practice or wherever they're going. Car rides are amazing. It's the perfect environment. Uh, again, that word perfect. It's a great environment for these conversations because they don't have to look at you and you as you're driving do not have to look at them. And that alone can actually create a really warm environment. Yeah, so I'll stop there for now. That's so great. I love the car ride illustration, um, especially, you know, in adolescence before they get their license, you're almost like, I don't want to say forced, but you're given this yeah. great opportunity to just really sit together. Um, it's, it feels very metaphorical, but it also seems very practical in what you're sharing. Um, can, so, can I also you. add, once they have their driver's license, don't feel like they're on their own. Ask them for rides. I love Seriously, <laughs> ask them for rides and say, oh my Unless gosh, you don't trust would you? your child's <laughs> yeah. Well, all the more reason, right? Because you don't want to send them off by themselves. But say, oh, would you mind dropping me off at this place and picking me back up? Yeah. I love that. That's so great. Um, now, some folks may have already had that conversation, or maybe they're in the process of it, or like to your point, maybe they've already put the ball in the court of their child right now and are sort of just waiting, or maybe hearing through a church leader that, you know, they're checking in with their child. I guess like moving forward then, um, what advice do you have for parents and, you know, how how can we raise children who are mentally healthy? Like, let's say we have the conversation, yeah. like, how do we keep that going? I know. And, you know, mental health is such an elusive thing. It feels so non-concrete. And, and I think that's why it's challenging. You know, if you had a medical issue, for example, right, then usually there's like a well laid out plan. You know, if you have a broken arm, usually it's going to take this long to heal and you need to, you know, wear a cast and then you go to PT. And, you know, there's usually a protocol for mental health. A lot of people, because that that pathway is not so concrete. Um, it makes us hesitate even more. But even before, right, mental health goes out of out of whack, I guess, I just want to say, just as we approach physical health, right, we can also approach mental health. Um, I love this thing called mental health hygiene. And I really do think this is the way we need to do it, right? How do we raise mentally healthy children? Well, we need to practice. How do they ever learn to do anything? I'm sure you're still feeding your child, but you get your child to do things on her own now, right? Whether they make a mess or not, you hopefully are giving, you know, her food and then she just like, you know, <laughs> is learning maybe to use the spoon, maybe, you know, a fork, but you know, it's going to be a mess, but you still do it. Why? Because as she practices, gets better and better. And look at you now. You're probably a master at using chopsticks and doing all these things. It didn't happen overnight, right? And that's the point. It has to be pretty consistent, pretty routine, this mental health hygiene. You know, I always ask people this, but what do we do twice a day for two minutes each? We brush our teeth. What does that do? Think about it. It's only twice a day, two minutes at a time, but it does so many things for us. It staves off gingivitis, plaque, right? Prevents cavities, prevents oral cancers, bad breath. I mean, you name it so many things from twice a day, two minutes at a time. That's called hygiene, right? So when we think about mental health hygiene, that's exactly what it is. Two very concrete mental health hygiene or hygienic things that I could leave everyone with is one, I want you to know anxiety research, you know, is showing us that it's off the charts, especially with young people. Well, if that's the case, and what's interesting about anxiety is that it always manifests through the body. Think about that. And that's global doesn't matter what cultural background you're coming from, what language you speak, anxiety will always manifest bodily, right? Palpitations, shortness of breath, feels like somebody's kind of choking you, you're 
pupils dilate, um, your heart is beating super fast, you're sweaty, your palms are sweaty, right, clammy. All of those things are physical reactions, and that's how anxiety manifests. So I want to leave people with this thing called tame the body, tame the anxiety, right? This means we need to teach our children how to tame the body. You know, oftentimes when, especially when my child was younger, we wouldn't sleep, right? There's like a whole bedtime routine, right? Kathy, if you're not already doing it, you need to incorporate deep breathing before she sleeps, right? And that's teaching her how to tame the body. Because now you're teaching her these tools that when anxiety hits, she has that resource, right? One of the best ways to tame the body, deep breathing, right? By the way, it releases about 70% of your toxins in your bloodstream when we do deep breathing. Can you imagine? It's so good for us, right? All adults, all parents, every hour you should have an alarm that says deep breathing and it should go off on your phone. You should remind yourself. But the same thing with our kids. We need to teach our kids how to do that. The second thing is name it to tame it, right? Hopefully this is helpful. But what's so interesting is what research shows us is when we experience something that's wounding, right? Or we have a bad experience or a negative experience or somebody has hurt us, right? Oftentimes in the Korean family, we, we try to kind of sweep it under the rug or, oh no, if my mom found out she'll be hurt so I can't tell her, right? But what's interesting is at those moments when we can name exactly what the feeling is, what we're doing with our brains is, remember, emotions are all about the right brain, right? Because it's creative, it's artsy, emotions live in the right brain. So when your emotions are high, one of the best things we can do is engage our left brain. And one of the simplest ways to engage the left brain, because that then helps to regulate the right brain, right? Uh, again, is to name it. Just name for yourself, my gosh, when my teacher said this to me, I felt really betrayed. Just naming it is meaningful because you've now engaged that process of naming something, identifying that emotion and naming it for yourself, engaged your left brain, which then now helps to regulate your right brain, right? So imagine when we teach our young kids these hygienic moments that they can do instead of just sitting with the negative feelings and just sleeping it away, for example, because we know it doesn't go away, builds up, right? But teaching them these little tiny hygienic moments can do a lot for their mental health. Wow, I had to do a deep breathing when my internet just cut out briefly. <laughs> I felt anxiety there. So thank you for the on the spot um, practical tips that I was able to use right away. But that's, that's wow, wow, that's incredible. Like the focus on deep breathing. I hope when we all brush our teeth, hopefully tonight <laughs> or tomorrow morning, instead of just brushing our teeth, we'll also think about this idea of mental health hygiene because I think that's so practical and so important. So, yeah, and that means we have to prioritize it, right? I mean, hopefully um, it makes us anxious when kids sleep without brushing their teeth, right? Because we know what could happen, especially if you're prone to cavities like me, right? So there's a, a, a sense of urgency there. That means we also have, need to have that same sense of urgency and priority and, and making it feel important. Not like just this thing we do once in a while, but actually this could really help you in those moments when nobody else can help you, right? Yeah. I do appreciate how these questions can feel really big and abstract and heavy, but I think if anything so far from what we're learning, I feel like it's very practical when we take it bite size and it's very consistent is like a theme I'm hearing. Um, so I am sure we're all taking our notes right now <laughs> to implement right away. So thank you. Um, we do have a question that was a little bit more specific around um, maybe parents who are struggling with, you know, reconciling expectations that they might have on their children uh, with the aspirations that their child might have that might be very different than what maybe the parent had envisioned. And I'm sure I've experienced this myself. I'm sure it's going to happen, but I guess what would you say for those parents? You mean you don't want your child to be a YouTube star because that's what they all want to be, you know, or a gamer, professional gamer, right? Um, woo, 
is challenging. But this is actually one of those things where, again, you might want to say, what if my child wasn't my own? Mm. And this is my friend's child seeking my advice, right? Yeah, I think that's something that's helpful. But, you know, I think so much of good parenting is really self-reflecting on ourselves, Mm. right? Like, one thing we should constantly ask ourselves is for whose benefit? Mm. For whose benefit do I want this child to be this PhD, MD, you know, maybe a JD and throw in like another like EDD, you know, like for whose benefit? Is it really for their benefit? Is it really, you know, for the benefit of those people who might benefit because of your child? Or is there any piece of that that's about my benefit, right? And as hard as it is, I think if the answer, like the genuine, authentic, painful, but the truth is actually, it is a little bit about my benefit, then I think that's cue for us to say, okay, that's probably the wrong thing to be pushing on my child, right? Yeah. But also, you know, I think one of the issues we have is we wait till they're like in their late adolescence, they're about to go off to college and needing to pick a major to have these conversations about what they should become. Right. Um, You know, in one of my books I wrote, don't ask your child what they want to be when they grow up. Ask them who they want to be, because that's fundamentally different. I mean, Korean American parents, do we really need any more examples of an MD, right, who comes back home when they're 35 and won't leave their room? Do we really need more examples of that? You know, in Korea, they're still reeling from an incident that happened not too long ago where this student who was celebrated because they got manseon, like the perfect score on the sunung, which is the college entrance exam. Can you even imagine that's possible? But this, you know, student did it and they celebrated him and he was on every TV show, you know, Achimadang, and, you know, how did you do it? How did your parents do it? You know? And then guess what? They're reeling because not too long ago, he stabbed his girlfriend 18 times because she tried to break up with him. Yeah, and he was a medical student at Yonsede, right? So why am I sharing this with you? I think there are things that we seek and pursue, right? And at the end of the day, we have to think, who do we want our children to become, right? Not what should they become? What kind of person should they become, right? Because fundamentally, it doesn't matter what they end up, what career they end up in. What's really going to matter, even it, even making that career sustainable for them, right? What's really going to contribute to that is not really about a degree or getting them to go a certain way, but really what kind of person are they? right? What can they contribute to the world that nobody else can the way that my child can, given the experiences, given the natural talents, right? And the natural likings that this child has. Like, that's what we need to be looking for. And so parents, I want to encourage all of us, let's observe. We are observers of our children. We're looking at them, observing them in their natural environment. When they're playing, we're watching them. Not because we want to like shadow that with what we think, right? Of course, we want to open up opportunities and expose them to as much as we can, right? Within reason, right? If they say, I need to go to Disneyland every weekend because I, I want to study roller coasters, come on, right? Probably not your role that you're going to take them to Disneyland every weekend. We have to be reasonable and, and very rational and also realistic, but we want to first observe. I mean, much much of the parenting is observing. What works well with my child? What kind of voice, right, that I use actually gets a different reaction from my child? Like, these are the things we need to be observing. Watch what they're naturally drawn to. Observe what affinities they have just naturally. You know, my child, for example, was obsessed with space. I mean, for a good while, I'm talking years, right? And everything was about space. Well, how cool, 
he would also get in trouble, you know, by his kindergarten teacher because he would only read nonfiction books about space. <laughs> you know, you would think he would have been praised, you know, but she was always so adamant he needed to read fiction books. <laughs> But knowing that, I would praise him if he brought home a, a book about space gems. Does that interest me? No. <laughs> no. Do I think that's interesting? Not at all. But that's what he had a natural affinity to. And who knows how God's going to use that one day, right? The tidbit that he drew from those books that he brought, who knows how, how that information is going to work in his life? You just don't know. Um, but a big part of it is observing. And again, that question for whose benefit, ask that. I ask myself that quite a bit, probably a couple times a, a day, <laughs> right? Okay, for whose benefit? <laughs> for whose benefit do I want him to dress up in khakis right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that would resolve a lot of, you know, arguments before it happens when you ask that question. So if anything, everyone, let's not be perfect and ask ourselves for who, for whose benefit. Um, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we definitely have some questions from our audience that so we want to make sure that we get to them because it is a rare opportunity to just be able to sit with you like this. And I think it's really special. Um, someone from the audience had asked, you know, are you aware of any mental health challenges that tend to be experienced at higher rates among Korean American youth? Oh, goodness. You ready for the list? <laughs> And you know, it's not necessarily because we're Korean Americans, but it's really more the cultural pieces, I think, right? And so any family that isn't going to openly talk about their struggles, for example, there's going to be high anxiety. Think about that. It's kind of commonsensical, isn't it? Right? Because just because you don't talk about it doesn't mean the tension isn't there. Right? I mean, it cracks me up when parents are like, oh, my kids don't know we fight all the time. I'm like, really? Like, what's your, what makes you believe that? And they'll say, well, we don't do it in front of them. I'm like, okay, so when they come home, they don't feel the tension, the denseness in the house, you know, the heaviness. Um, that's really assuming that our kids are dumb, right? I mean, our kids are brilliant. They probably, um, this generation of kids probably have higher IQ than anybody in my generation, just by virtue of being who they are, right? In this generation, in these environments. Um, and so what does that mean? Yeah, any, so again, that's outside of being Korean American. I would hate for us to think, oh my gosh, when you're Korean American, you've got these issues, right? I also wanna say when you're Korean American, um, we are a minoritized group. Right, and it's never fair to just look within ourselves to say what are what's our frailty and why are we so broken. We also need to look at the systems we have to navigate through on a daily basis, the external forces that really keep us vulnerable too. Right, the lack of representation. How many Korean American teachers, right, have you had and has your child had? Right, yeah, probably pretty low. Right, Kathy, I remember you when you came to our school, you were like, you're the first Korean American yeah. teacher I've ever had. And you were how old, may I ask? I was 28, I want to say, which is wild. Mm -hmm. I, I asked myself, why did I have to go to grad school to see someone that looked like me in front of the classroom? And for mm -hmm. everyone here, I actually had an emotional reaction. I actually teared up when I saw you speak for the first time. It was in the lecture hall and it was just so powerful that here I am in the space at Harvard Graduate School of Education and here I am someone that that looks like me in front of the classroom and you know mm -hmm. I think in that time everyone was saying it's important to have you know teachers of color or teachers that reflect their students in the classroom and I, as a former mm -hmm. teacher I said of course that's important but it's very different when you actually sit in that chair and you see someone that you respect but looks like you. It gives you this, oh, like, why not me? Like, it, what's possible for me too, you know? And I, I didn't yeah. realize that until I experienced it myself. So, yeah. Yeah. So all these external <laughs> forces, right? That, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the lack of representation, having to go through an entire K through 12, K through 16 education without learning about your people. 
you know, those are all going to have mental health impacts, right? And again, it's outside of being Korean American. Some things that are very specific to Korean Americans, though, we have a very traumatic past, right? As a nation, our mother country, <laughs> right? Um, think about all of the the gruesome and devastating history that Koreans have had to live with. And it doesn't matter if you're a third, fourth generation Korean American living in the US and never having stepped foot in Korea, right? That trauma gets carried down and we pass it on to our future generations, both through biology, but also in the way we parent environmentally, right? And so all of that gets passed down. And very rarely do we ever think about the trauma that we've experienced and this idea of unpacking it healing from it, healing together from it, talking about its impact, we rarely do that. And so it's very difficult to heal from. And so I definitely see a lot of like post-traumatic stress disorder. And by the way, when you already have a disposition for you know these traumatic types of reactions and experiences, um, it doesn't take much to ignite that PTSD, right? Because it, the, the platform is already set so it doesn't take too much, right? For something maybe what seemingly looks like a small event could actually be felt very, um, again, very maximized and heightened because of that propensity, right? Towards um, those experiences, yeah. So I think that's one. I think our, our parent generation rarely talks about how traumatic immigration is, right? <laughs> um, this idea of, leaving people that you love. Um, and if you came in the 60s and 70s, which actually was the second largest wave of Korean um, immigration, you really came with this idea that you were never going to see them again because things were not the way they are now. They didn't have cacao, right? <laughs> you couldn't just video call them, <laughs> right? I mean, you could write letters, but it took months. You could call them, but it was so expensive. Right. So it was very short, even if you were able to call. And so they really came with full abandon, cutting off these love, you know, loving relationships and basically saying to themselves, hago, hago. like I'm self-determined when I make this move that I'm leaving behind and burying a lot of people will say, right, I will bury them in my heart. And, you know, because more than likely you wouldn't be able to visit them again. And so there's so much loss and grief, right? And again, loss and grief, um, it's passed on, right? Again, through biology and through parenting, because the way we speak, that's going to reflect the things that we hold, right? The way we interact with our children, right? I think there's so much um, unresolved grief that manifests in depression in our communities, right? And that's what depression is. It's like a deep-seated wounding and an anger, right? If you unpack depression, oftentimes there's a deep-seated anger that's like boiling underneath, right? Either something that should not have happened to me happened or something that should have happened to me didn't happen, right? And just because we don't talk about it or we don't acknowledge it, um, doesn't mean that it doesn't manifest itself, right? And uh, get reflected somehow in our relationships and in the way um, that, you know, in our mannerisms and the way we speak, it, the way we interact, that type of thing. I also see often in the Korean American families that there's a, there's kind of a cutting off emotionally, right? There's like a, a it's like a stunted emotional growth. So oftentimes we'll see Korean American adults behaving in ways that we might often see in toddlers, right? Like temper tantrums, for example, or resorting to substances, outside things because you don't have, or you feel like you don't have what it takes to kind of handle something. So this reliance, right? On people who are outside of you, outside sources. Um, as adults, actually, we were supposed to practice these skills so that by the time you reach adulthood, 
right? Um, you can practice those skills and you have that agency and the resources, you know, at your disposal. But oftentimes because we're so stunted emotionally and you get stunted emotionally when you're not given the opportunity to practice your emotions, right? So for example, if a child cries, Ujima, stop crying. That's nothing to be crying about. Guess what we just did? We stunted our child's emotions, right? Instead, yeah, cry as much as you want, right? Let them practice the emotions because how can you actually learn to manage and regulate those emotions if you don't actually let it out, right? And it's not going to be pretty, but again, for whose benefit? Is it more hurtful to you to watch your child in so much pain? Of course, it hurts us more, you know, because we're parents. As mothers, they literally were connected to us by the umbilical cord, right? We literally were one. So we feel everything that they're feeling. You know, it, even now, my mother will call me and say, oh, I just had this feeling, everything okay, right? Because we're so connected. Um, and it does hurt us when our children are hurting, but again, for whose benefit, right? And if they're going to have that ugly cry somewhere, wouldn't you want it to be in your home, like in front of you, right? And my best advice would be just ugly cry with them. Yeah. Oh, I'm going all over the place. <laughs> no, I, I love it. No, I think it's great. I, a part as a new parent, I'm like, everyone should be in this session so that when you hear my child crying in the airplane, they won't stop them because they're stunting their emotion, emotional <laughs> growth. <laughs> so I think it's good for, for those of us who may not have children, this hopefully will provide more empathy and an opportunity to understand maybe what the child's going through while the parents are like, ah, so thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really sound advice for everyone here. Um, and I'm actually really excited. Someone had actually asked um, what practical steps can dual income, no income, Dual income, no kids, DI and KS. Um, oh, I never thought that way. Sorry, I'm learning as I'm going. Um, so I guess folks who have dual income but no kids take to prepare for parenting. So good for you for being here and maintain a healthy relationship as a couple. Mm, my goodness, you know what? And this is exactly when, it's the perfect time. Oh, perfect again. But it's the best time. <laughs> to do parenting skills when you don't have kids yet. <laughs> in fact, I think it's one of the biggest mistakes we make in the Korean American communities. You know, we always wait till people are parents before we learn about parenting. But honestly, it needs to happen, like, even when they're younger, even before you're married. You need to learn about marriage before you're married, right? You need to learn about kids before you have children. So thank you for being here. And what a great question. You know, Sorry for saying this, but your lives right now are so much easier yeah. <laughs> because you don't have this like live person, you know, um, pulling at you for your attention. And so it's a great time, I think, because you've got this opportunity to work. Yes, build your finances, because one thing you learn as a parent, my gosh, everything is expensive, right? Um, unfortunately, good opportunities often means money. Right. And so I think, yeah, just realistically speaking, yeah, make sure you plan financially. I would also say, though, what you also need to plan is, OK, now we we're in the season of making money. But when this child comes, that season is going to change. Right. So instead of just talk toying, like it's hitting you in the face, I would plan for it. Right. What does that mean? When do you each take your leaves? Right. Um, yeah. How do you rotate? Also, is it doable for both of you to continue? And if so, does one person need to go part time? You know, like all of these are, are conversations you should have. And trust me, it's better to have those conversations now than it is with like a child in your hands. Right. But this is also a great time to think about your parenting values, right? What is allowable? What is something that you can tolerate? What is something you absolutely cannot tolerate? Do we really want our child to be bilingual? If so, how do we plan for that? 
right? I mean, this is a great opportunity. One of the biggest issues in parenting and what messes up our kids is when the parents cannot agree, right? On the parenting style, on what's important, right? And what discipline looks like. These are all conversations you need to have truly before you have your child. So it's amazing that you're here. Yeah, I hope that gave you a few ideas. Attend as many parenting seminars and read as many books you can right now. <laughs> I love that. I think it's a great, I think something that was really helpful for us too was um, just going to a couple's house that had kids, like their home, just like, hey, we'll come, we'll bring, what do you want for dinner? We'll just bring dinner for us just to like sit and like watch. I think it helps mm -hmm. like break down the dreamy, you know, but also really see like things that we were really looking forward to. Um, so I, I also agree with you. I wish I came to the seminar before, <laughs> before we had our little one, but I'm glad to, to see um, everyone here and asking these great questions. So this next question, I'm going to try to hopefully relay it as best as I can. Um, so someone's asking, what advice do you have for parents who are trying to break away from the parenting methods they grew up with while acknowledging that their parents' approach wasn't entirely negative? So pros and cons. Mm -hmm. How can they navigate their own parenting journey with new information, especially when they notice similarities to their parents' methods in challenging situations? Any practical mm -hmm. tips would be appreciated. Yeah, I mean, one thing to note about parenting is it doesn't matter how much you know in your head sometimes, like what comes out and, you know, your demeanor. Actually, there's like a default way um, of acting if we're not careful, right? So one of the key things, in my opinion, that's so important, and we talk about this when we think about bias, for example, like our immediate automatic thought right, or automatic behaviors. So there's a guy by the name of Kahneman who talks about this systems one and systems two thinking. I'll explain what they are and hopefully it'll make sense and, and especially um, in why I'm bringing this up. But systems one thinking is pretty automatic. It's reactive, right? Um, you don't give a lot of thought to things. Um, again, it's, it's kind of quick. And so it's not as intentional and deliberate. But what that means is if we're not careful, because education is caught, right? Not necessarily taught, what does that mean? You will regurgitate what you saw, right? In your own home when you were raised, like when you were growing up, that becomes your default mode. So what that means is if we're doing systems one thinking, we're gonna default to that without even thinking, it's automatic. Right. If if you started crying and the first thing you were told is Ujima, then guess what's going to come out of your mouth? Stop crying. Right. If when you try to talk about your deep inner wounds, right, and the first thing you were told was, oh, stop, that's not even a big deal. Then guess what? That becomes your default way of, of responding, right? Because again, it's kind of automatic. It's what you grew up with. So if you want to break that, then we have to start utilizing our systems two thinking. Systems two thinking is deliberate, is slow, painstakingly slow, right? But because it's so deliberate and slow, it means that we don't default automatically to our system's one way of behaving, right? It's much more intentional. It also gives you like a stoppage, right? Okay, let me think for a minute here, right? This is what I want to say, but do I really want to say that? Do you remember what that felt like when you were told those things, right? Do I really want to repeat that cycle? So that's systems two thinking. And if we can get ourselves there, I think we would do everybody a lot of favors because when we do the default type of parenting, even we as parents don't feel good after that, right? Yeah, even we don't feel good. Like no parent ever wakes up and says, I'm gonna wound my child as much as possible today. Nobody does that, right? And yet we do hurt, hurt our children. And oftentimes it's because we're operating out of the systems one thinking. love that systems to thinking um 
thinking, pausing, reflecting, asking those yes. questions. I'm going to bring up that question again Who, for whose benefit. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's awesome. Thank you for, you know, sharing that. This is such a wealth of information. I'm just soaking it in. I have to make sure that I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Um, we have some, I mean, again, thank you everyone for asking your questions. Please continue to ask them. We'll try to make sure we get to all of them. Yes, Dr. Joe, please drink your water because you have some questions coming your way. Um, thank you. These are great questions. Someone had asked, um, I want my son to find what he's naturally drawn to and have talents for. What should I emphasize to my son as more general social skills like good writing? Mm. Like the humanities, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how sad that Korean colleges are now like without any humanity courses. You can't take a writing course anywhere, right? Um, and it's, yeah, but you can learn to code. <laughs> um, so I'm really, really grateful for this question and the fact that, you know, we value these types of skills still. Um, so again, I think it takes a lot of observing to see what our children are naturally drawn to. But also, no, it's like a fine art, right? Because yes, we see what they're drawn to, but can we really see what they're drawn to if they've only seen, let's say, three things, right? And so we do want to kind of broaden, I think, what they're exposed to. And how would they ever be exposed without trying something? And so if, if good writing is something you want them to try, let's do it. You know, one thing that I um, implemented, you know, since my child was very, very young was reading out loud together, right? And a lot of us do this when they're toddlers, right? But my child is 12 and guess what? Yeah, I still read out loud to him. Why? Because <laughs> I do it for many reasons. But one, it's so good for their development, right? And no matter what's happened during the day, yeah, you've got ups and downs because come on, he's a preteen, right? <laughs> no day is like smooth sailing. <laughs> but we can put all that aside and we can sit next to each other and he can listen to my soothing, right? Psychologists, like, <laughs> boy, you know, voice reading a book to him. And we can engage in a topic that I think is interesting to him. Certainly something I couldn't come up with on my own right? And hopefully something that has a good lesson for him, right? So you need a researcher books. You don't want to just pick off, you know, any, any book and say, oh, it's important to read to your child to read. No, it's a wonderful way to, to broach topics that maybe you, it's hard for you to bring up, but this book brings it up. How perfect, right? It's a great way to converse. But I mentioned that to say, if good writing is your thing, start, right? Maybe it's at the breakfast table, and say, if you can say one sentence about how you might describe, you know, how you want this day to go. Because even if they don't like physically write it or type it, that's still writing, right? Um, and so, yeah, definitely exposure is important. But the key is watching what they're naturally, you know, drawn to, what they have an affinity for, exposing them to as much as you can, again, within reason, right? And then saying, how can we combine a lot of these things together, right? So my child, who's very extroverted and loves his friends, right? And, you know, that's wonderful. But you want them to do some writing? Maybe when like two or three come over, maybe you do that little exercise I gave you, right? I mean, just something silly, but hey, would you guys humor me? And then try it out, okay? Right? So I don't know if there's a way that you can tap into multiple development aspects. I think that's usually the best way. You, you know, for example, like my son is an athlete, but it's not just about playing that sport and getting good at that sport. It's about the teamwork. Mm -hmm. It's about, right, passing the ball. It's about, right, passing the ball when you know you have a clear shot pass it to somebody because you know it actually means something when that child who never maybe makes those two points can actually have that chance right mm -hmm. so it's so much more but again you're tapping into all sorts of developmental stuff there emotional social moral even right learning to share and and letting somebody else have the spotlight mm -hmm. right the spiritual the sense of calling but at the end of the day it really is about that spiritual sense of calling that i want to just really highlight for us um 
I'm not even talking about a religious aspect right now. I'm talking about a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And that sense of purpose usually comes from being able to say, my gosh, I think I could add something to this in a way that maybe other people cannot. Again, given not only my talents and interests, but my life experiences. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing with you now is actually out of my personality, right? But I have a purpose, a sense of purpose in that because I know why I was taken to Korea at the you know, sensitive age of 13, right? And brought back to the US, back and forth, back and forth. It's those life experiences that really gives you, it's, it's really like the, the wounds, right? That we get our calling from. Right? It's kind of a famous saying now. Um, and I think that's true. So your question about they've got great talents, they're naturally drawn to things. Yes, I want them to also expand that, like general social skills. But at the end of the day, yeah, what is that DNA, the spiritual DNA, right? What could serve as their life's purpose? Because we find that when people have a sense of purpose, um, it doesn't take much for them to actually live meaningful lives. It doesn't take much for them to actually find hope. These are all good things for our mental health, right? Yeah, in fact, that's what's going to help them overcome a lot of the challenges, right? I talk about Viktor Frankl quite a bit, but he's a Jewish um, psychologist who was uh, in concentration camps, right? So much death all around him. And he actually looked and observed to see who it is that actually survived those conditions. And it was people who didn't lose a sense of hope. And how did they not lose that sense of hope? Because they had a sense of purpose, right? Pretty amazing. Yeah. Oof. Um, I'm sure that, you know, resonates with a lot of folks. And I think whether we're tired <laughs> after a day of parenting or whether we're excited or getting ready, I think there's so much nuggets of wisdom here. And there's a question here that I think is very um, relevant to kind of what we're experiencing in our political climate, maybe not just in the U.S., but maybe elsewhere as well. Um, but I think it's very interesting. And I, I feel like you would also love answering this, Dr. Joe. Um, this question it says, while at a restaurant, my son and I experienced racial discrimination from someone mm -hmm. Nearby. My son was very upset, but I struggled to respond because English is my second language. What can I do to support my son in these situations? What can I say to my son who is emotionally upset about the whole situation? Oh, gosh, yes. And it is so upsetting. Um, so first, thank you for this question and even recognizing how important this is for your child, because I think oftentimes we might just say, like, shake it off, right? Well, that's just the reality, like, shake it off. It might happen all the time. You just need to get used to it. Um, so I really appreciate how you saw his reaction and, and um, yeah, how meaningful it was for you to recognize, right, how impactful that experience was. I would say... Um, this is one of those times where you need to seek resources, right? Especially if English is not like, um, you know, it's one thing to speak English, but it's another thing to speak like in racial terms, right? And, and be knowledgeable about like the current events and all of these things. And so this is a great time to tap into people who might have that knowledge, right? So I'm thinking like school counselors, hopefully your youth pastor, right, would be a great person. Um, this is also a time where you might just, you know, reach out to, let's say, your youth pastor and say, you know, this thing happened. I want my child to have a safe space to be able to discuss it. Um, I don't think I would do a great job of that, but I wonder if there's a space at the church, right? Because certainly your child is not the only one, right? More than likely, it's happened to so many others. We just don't talk about it. And so why not open up that space, right? Um, and maybe, you know, and for youth pastors who might be joining here, if you're like, oh, no, I couldn't handle that conversation. It's okay. Invite another counselor to join you and you could co-facilitate, right? And just have an open conversation. I think that would be so valuable. At the end of the day, it's helpful to talk about what happened, right? It's also helpful to name, remember, name it to tame it. We need to name the impact it's had, right? So yeah, that made me so angry. That's really important for your child to actually name, 
right? Well, what part of that made you so angry? Because everybody should have the right to live in peace, right? Like we're Americans too. Yeah. I mean, essentially it's all about just listening. So the part, you know, the role that we as adults, we often feel like we have to teach a lesson or we have to give advice. Actually, that's the last thing they want. <laughs> the one thing that they actually appreciate is just listen, empathize. If you really don't know what to say, just say that, right? I'm feeling all these things. I just don't know how to put it into words. That's okay, right? But I want to hear more, right? Yeah. Um, and so listening is huge. Validating them. Validating meaning, yeah, that was so hurtful. It bothers me as an adult. I can't ima you know, even imagine what it's like for you as a child, right? That's validating. Um, that means, yes, what you're saying is true, right? You didn't make that stuff up. You have good reason to be angry. You know, there's a righteous anger. And it's one of those cases where this is a righteous anger. They're looking at a social injustice and reacting. And guess what? That's a beautiful thing that we actually want to teach our children, right? Don't be quick about, well, what can you do next time, right? I know we want to jump there because that's more comfortable for us because it's much more cerebral, <laughs> less emotions, right? But don't be quick to jump to that. Give them ample time to just come out with it. Sit in the pain, I like to say. Sit in the pain. That is the best thing you can do for them. And listen. Yeah. I love that. Sit in the pain. <laughs> as hard as it might be, sit in the yeah. pain. Um, I think, yeah, that it, it, it reminds me again of, of the whole like systems too that you were talking about. Al, instead of reacting, like how can we take a pause, sit, reflect, and really think about what is coming out. Um, so I think that's really, really, really helpful. Um, I, oh, I know we're about to, we have to wrap up with our time. We have so many great questions. I'm gonna try to maybe um, uh, like two more questions. Um, one is around um, this idea of large extended families. How can we effectively navigate mental health challenges when you have this extended family system. And someone also said, we're also in the thick of the sandwich generation. I'm trying to combine two questions. Um, how can we maintain this balance in our own health as we maintain this dynamic of, you know, working with a larger family? Woo, it's so hard. Um, the sandwich generation, you know, you've got your often ailing parents and you wanna honor them as much as you can, but you've also got younger, um, you know, people that we're trying to raise and uh, it's very difficult. Um, so we acknowledge it's truly difficult. Mm -hmm. We also acknowledge that it's a tremendous opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity because I wanna say people who are in this space right now, right? We know what's good about both sides. Both sides meaning like both Korean and American, right? You and I know what's effective and what doesn't work about both of those things and how wonderful because then you and i are the perfect filters right again we're not going to be perfect right um, especially when you know our parents are going off about something what you'll notice about the family dynamics and family systems if you ever read about family systems <laughs> is that it doesn't matter how old you are as a child once you go back into that system you go right back into your role that you played as a child this is why like 50 year olds will come and say, where's dinner, mom, right? <laughs> yeah, when you go back home, because <laughs> you just kind of, you know, fall back into that system. And so again, that's the systems one thinking, but the systems two thinking says, how can I be intentional about actually what could be a truly amazing opportunity? This means that any ugliness that comes out, right? That you, that the child witnesses, talk about it talk about it. It also means you're not going to be perfect, right? But it means we need to name it for our children. I'll give you a perfect, another perfect, I'll give you a good example. So I was in Korea this summer. My father was ailing the summer, right? Like he had this foot injury. He also had this shoulder injury. So we were 
I was, you know, accompanying him to one clinic, to another, to another, you know, and that was really my trip this time. I was really, really happy to be there for it, right? And that I could um, be there to do that for him. But one day he started, he has this whole balcony of plants and I love plants, but he chose this time that day when he's ailing to move all these heavy plants. And I had kind of reached my limit. <laughs> <laughs> so I did my voice did raise a little bit and I was like dad stop what you're doing you're not helping your conditions you know like can we please be smart about what you're doing and my son said to me later he's like mom you were yelling at Anabaji right so my son like witnessed the whole thing and I was like you know I was and that was wrong right so I named it I named, I acknowledged that it was wrong. And I also said, and it really came because my heart was for Harabaji, right? I really wanted to protect him. I wanted him to not do these things that I knew were hurting him more. And that's where it came from. But yes, you're right. And that I didn't do it in the best way. And that was amazing, right? That conversation with my son, because he saw a frailty and a weakness in me. And it wasn't like, well, I had good reason to do that, right? Um, but instead, it's like, oh my gosh, I know. This is why I did it. Doesn't make it right, right? And then what was best is that he saw me and my dad reconcile, right? And that's what's healing about this whole thing. We can't help that there are going to be heightened emotions, disagreements, you know, sometimes people are manipulative because remember, we're all balls of wounds, right? We speak out of our wounds and we act out of our wounds, all of us, every one of us. And with our families, you get the worst of it because we're so comfortable with each other. Think about it. You know, this person isn't going to walk out on you. You know, this person isn't going to like disown you, right? And because of that comfortable, like, you know, the sense of, safety in a strange way we actually show our ugliest self in our families right and that's okay because we're not perfect people but when it does again I want to encourage us with saying it's really how we recover from that and how we bridge gaps from that and how we forgive and ask for forgiveness from those things that's what's going to be valuable for your kids right for our kids I should say yeah. Wow. Oof. Yeah, resonates in so many ways. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. I think we'll end with this last question. I know I wish we had more time. Um, but I feel like this question is very um related to what you had mentioned about Victor Frankel and and the finding about the importance of hope and finding a sense of purpose. So this mm -hmm. parent is asking, how do I support my teenage son in finding that sense of purpose? He is far away from God and seems to keep a distance with parents or rejecting anything that's part of, you know, Korean culture or anything related um, yeah. to, you know, conversations with the parent. Yeah. You know, I think when kids are like that, um, first of all, please know it's part of a process, right? Would you believe it? I had a many, many years where I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, filled with anger, didn't want, I was anti-Korea, you know, I would see a Korean no car pass and be like, Ugh, you know, um, so it's actually a very normal part of their racial identity development. And we can't blame them for that because the general population doesn't look like us. What's revered, right, in this society that we live in, um, again, doesn't look like us, smell like us, walk like us, right, all those things. Um, and so just know it's a process. And what I'm learning that's so challenging with parenting, like for myself, is that it takes a lot of patience. You know, what's hard about parenting is that you don't necessarily see the fruits of your labor immediately. It's just the way it is. Think about how many times you thought, oh my gosh, this is what my mom went through, right? For the women in the room, mothers in the room, when you had your baby, wasn't that one of the first things you thought about? How did my mom do this three times? You know? <laughs> there are certain things you just don't know 
and don't realize you just can't developmentally it's impossible until a certain time comes and oftentimes it may not even be in our lifetime but what does that mean we have to trust we have to trust right first in god and we even have to trust our kids you know i'm not going to assume fragility in you i know one day yeah all of this will make sense i know lots of things don't make sense right now that's okay that's just part of life and part of growing up right but i know one day yeah you'll figure it out right i mean it seems like they're parting ways with a lot of things the last thing you want to do is become a part of the the thing that they're parting from right yeah I mean, how many times have you needed that patience from your parents? Right. One time I came across a picture and I, I was wearing this like a super ugly, just funky hat, you know? And I was like, mom, how could you let me walk out of the house with this thing? And she's like, I go, you know, right? <laughs> You know, it was like a conversation, I think, almost every day, like, are you sure you want to wear that hat? <laughs> but at the time, it was the coolest thing. Mm. But now if you were to force me and pay me to wear that hat, I would say no. Mm. Right. But I mean, I'm simplifying it. But that is what development is. Mm. And so let's trust the process. And in the process, what you and I can do as parents is act as that soft cushioning right? Yeah, I don't like what's happening to you right now. I mean, come on, the last, you know, email I got from my son's school before the school ended, right? <laughs> before the summer was that he pants somebody. I'm like, what? What does that even mean? I'm like, how does the word pants become a verb? Like what? And think about what I do as a profession. I should go bury my head in the sand somewhere. My child did what? Like, do you know what I do for a living? <laughs> but my child came home and I said, so you, you pant somebody? <laughs> like, how does that even become a verb? And we laughed about it because he said, mom, this is just something we do to each other. Right? So we laughed about it, said, okay, so it's like a cool thing preteen boys do to each other. And can we also think about what could have gone horribly wrong there, right? <laughs> what if you maybe uh, not only pantsed, but underwear somebody, right? <laughs> like, oh my goodness, what could have happened there, you know? <laughs> so I try to find a way where it was like, okay, I'm not your age, your your kid, you know, peers are saying this is something cool. So you wanted to be a part of it. Okay, I can I can get that, appreciate that. And also, can we think about some of the other things that perhaps at your age you can't see right now? Right. And that's the consequences of what could have gone badly and probably the reason you wouldn't want to do that again. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I, I feel like when you were sharing your, I was like curious, I was genuinely curious, what did you do Dr. Cho after you got that email? But I love the, the word that comes to mind is just like a spirit of curiosity that, that you approached it with of like, tell me what's, what, what is it exactly? Is it what I think it is? But using that as an opportunity to really engage your child and try to understand his world right. better, I think takes a lot of systems to thinking uh, of pausing and lots and, of, yeah lots of cold water and lots of deep breaths you know and time on the knees praying <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness well thank you I'm glad you ended on that note that you know again I think that was just a perfect oh not perfect great um you know illustration of how how hard parenting can be and also just how rewarding it can be in so many respects um, and so we really hope that this was um, a really meaningful time. I know personally, I was like taking notes on the side. I'll probably discuss it. Um, 
with my own family, all my takeaways, but I do want to encourage everyone here to continue to share out your learnings from tonight's session. I think this is really rich session of learning. And so thank you for tuning in. I'm going to just thank you. So everyone, if we can just give a virtual applause and lots of love, um, Dr. Joyner, you're very busy. And so to take time out to support parents and future parents and, and church leaders and those who are working with parents, it's an immense blessing and gift for us. And so I'm going to now close this out and pass it off to our amazing MSG staff to end us with some incredible announcements. Oh, wow. Um, thank you so much. I cannot believe how the time quickly went by. An hour and a half just went by. And I wish I could hear more from Dr. Joe and Kathy. And on behalf of MSG, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude uh, for Dr. Josephine Kim for her invaluable insights and wisdom and Kathy for moderating so beautifully. We truly appreciate both of you and a big thanks to our amazing audience as well for joining us today, despite your long day. So thank you so, so much. And I'd like to introduce you to several resources available on our website. We have an online directory of Korean American mental professionals across the nation. You can simply select your state to browse through listings. And also you'll find a range of reports, uh, bilingual blog posts, and podcasts. Whether you are looking for personal stories, tips on finding on the right therapist, or more, our website is valuable resource. And next, uh, your feedback is essential for improving our upcoming Heart to Healing Fireside Chat series. Please take a moment, if you can, to complete our survey. We will be attaching the link on our follow-up email as well, but this will help us enhance our monthly series. So I'll pause for a few seconds to allow you to take some time to scan the code. And um, yeah, last but not least, we would like to talk about um, giving. Your generosity can truly make a difference. By donating to our cause, you'll support our efforts to provide essential resources and support to Korean American individuals. Every contribution, no matter the size, helps us break down barriers and make mental wellness accessible to all. And once again, we extend our gratitude, deepest gratitude for everyone who joined us this Thursday evening. Um, and for those attending to MSG's monthly fireside uh, series for the first time, we invite you to stay connected as we continue to explore diverse topics with inspiring speakers in the months ahead. And we hope this time together was both encouraging and comforting. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night.